Coleman. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, so as um, Ed mentioned, we're going to be talking about summertime. This um, talk was originally scheduled in the spring, and um, we've made some adjustments. Um, so I adjusted the, the, the slides as well. Uh, again, my name is Kimberly Coleman, and um, I've been a registered nurse since 2003, and I have been studying traditional Chinese medicine since 2012, including four years in China when I got my PhD. Um, some of my areas of specialty include cardiovascular conditions, psycho-emotional and stress-related illnesses. Um, I also studied with a master there in pediatric tuina, as well as scalp acupuncture, which can treat lots of neurological conditions. Um, so some disclosures. Information contained in the presentation is just for educational and informational purposes only. Please do not use this information to self-diagnose or treat. Um, I'm happy to speak with you after if you have specific questions. Um, and again, um, because of my affiliation with Suburban and that um, this content of this presentation does not represent John Hop Johns Hopkins Medicine, Suburban Hospital, or their affiliates. So my objectives today are fourfold. Um, we're going to talk some about TCM theory, um, acupuncture, and some modalities that are included in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I'm going to share some summer dietary suggestions. Um, we're going to talk about some self-care treatments for different summertime illnesses and conditions. And then we'll have some question and answer at the end. So traditional Chinese medicine theory. I'll just read this for you um, as a great quote I found online that summarizes. Um, Traditional Chinese medicine is thousands of years old and has changed little over the centuries. Its basic concept is that the vital force of life called qi surges through our body, and any imbalance in that qi can cause disease or illness. This imbalance is most commonly thought to be caused by an alteration in the opposite and complementary forces that make up the qi, and these two forces are called yin and yang. So this image um, shows yin and yang. Yin is typically de is depicted as the black part of the circle, and yang is the white part of the circle. And they're associated with a lot of things that in nature. Um, yin is, um, represents the earth and the feminine, um, or the emotional aspect of ourselves, softness, heaviness, the moon. We have, it's a full moon yesterday. Um, and water, the water element. Um, yang, on the other hand, represents heaven or the sky, the masculine, um, rational or mental thought, hardness, lightness, um, the sun, and fire. So those two things are always um, interacting with one another and finding balance. And it's when they're out of balance um, that we have illness and disease. So it's believed that to regain balance, you must achieve the balance between the internal organs in our body uh, and the external elements of earth, fire, water, wood, and metal. So in Chinese medicine, there are also five elements um, that I just mentioned, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Now, we'll be talking mostly about the fire element because that is correlated with the summer season. Um, and late summer, which I'll talk more about, is associated with the earth element. So these are a couple pictures. Sorry, they're a little fuzzy. Um, so you can see there, summer and fire um, is at the top. Um, and then we move into late summer um, and, and fall, winter, and spring. And each of those are associated with one of the elements, um, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water, as we move from spring to winter throughout the year. Another way to think about how these five elements and the seasons are related um, is that there's a period of 18 days between each season that's sometimes seen as the earth element, but for today's purposes, we'll be talking about late summer when it's kind of damp and humid and hot. Um, so the five elements are also related to our emotions. Um, the fire element is uh, correlates with our heart organ, so each of the elements has an internal organ that it correlates with. Um, so the fire is our heart, and the earth element correlates with our spleen. And these are the emotions that uh, are also related to those elements. So if uh, things are out of balance um, in the summertime during the fire element, we may feel more impatience. Um, and for example, in the late summer, there may be more anxiety. 
So I want to share with you a little bit about TCM diagnosis. Um, the traditional texts describe this. Uh, in Chinese, it's pronounced Wang Wen Wen Tie. That's the four parts of the TCM diagnosis. So Wang is to look. Um, so even as the patient's entering the treatment room, we can see their body constitution, um, the color of their face, um, how they're carrying themselves into the room. So our diagnosis even begins at a distance. And then um, when is actually to smell, but also to listen. So um, how strongly someone takes their steps um, tells us a little bit more about them as, a, as an individual. Um, and then, of course, inquiry. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to ask lots of questions similar to what your doctor might ask you in an intake, um, but we um, focus on some different areas. And then the last piece is palpation. So we do do pulse diagnosis. That's one of the palpations, but sometimes we may want to palpate your abdomen um, and feel the temperature and texture of your skin. And the, the last piece of the TCM diagnosis is the tongue diagnosis. So this, um, this is an, a picture, an example of pulse diagnosis. Um, again, uh, feeling the texture and temperature of the skin. We check the radial pulse, um, which is nearest to our thumb. Uh, and there are three positions and three depths. And those, again, correlate with uh, organs in the body. So on both hands, we feel three pulses at three depths. And to get more information about the internal um, goings on, of the organs. Um, and again, we may do some abdominal palpation and also channel palpation. So as you may or may not know, in Chinese medicine, there's meridians or channels in the body. And sometimes we will palpate along those channels to find irregularities and then have a, be more discerning about where we're going to choose our points to treat. Um, this is a picture of the tongue map. Um, so you can see there that the heart the fire, the summer portion is there right at the tip. Sometimes if a patient has heart heat, we'll see some redness right at the tip of the tongue. When you go home, you can look in the mirror. Um, the spleen and stomach, which is related to late summer, is found in the middle of the tongue. Um, and then again, the other organs correlate with other elements and seasons. But we're looking at all of those together to, to gather more information about the internal workings of the body. So we look at the tongue body, the tongue coating, also the color and the texture. And sometimes there's different pathologies that may be there as well. And then we make a TCM diagnosis. So this is different than your Western diagnosis. Sometimes they correlate, but oftentimes one single Western diagnosis, for example, high blood pressure, might have um, many different TCM diagnoses because we see the individual um, not only their constitution, um, but also the season of the year. And so their hypertension may be different than someone else's hypertension, and so we need to treat it differently. Just like in Western medicine also, hypertension can be caused by kidney disease or atherosclerosis, or different, for different reasons you can have high blood pressure. So we, we also respect this. So the eight principles there, you see the yin and yang at the top. Um, these are just broad categories, so we're looking at the patient do they have an excess in their body or a deficiency? Are they more hot or are they more cold? Um, do they have an external condition or maybe an internal condition? Another type of diagnosis that we sometimes use is zhang fu, which means the internal and, and external organ. So you're, wondering, you're probably wondering, what does external organ mean? Well, those are the organs that uh, touch the outside. So um, starting with our mouth all the way down to our elimination, those are considered external organs. Um, and then, again, channel pathology. Lots of times with painful conditions, uh, it would, might be associated with a particular channel on the body. Um, so we'll make those TCM diagnoses, and then we'll develop a TCM treatment plan. So that would include the frequency and duration of the treatment. Um, any lifestyle changes, including diet and exercise, we'll talk more about diet today. Um, perhaps an herbal prescription. Um, and then after your treatment, it's important to drink a warm cup of water and pay attention to your body. You may have immediate, gradual, or perhaps no relief, and you want to note those changes to report to your acupuncturist at your next appointment. So now I'd like to share with you some TCM modalities. Um, the first and most well-known here in the U.S. is, of course, acupuncture. Um, but there are different types of acupuncture. 
um, auricular acupuncture, which is limited strictly to the ear, um, facial acupuncture, which is uh, limited to the face, scalp acupuncture, and then some body, body points can also use electrical stimu stimulation. E-STEM is another uh, way that we put it, and that's just putting these uh, probes on the tips of the needles while they're inserted in the body, and then we run a very gentle current um, just to stimulate the point more. Uh, this is often used more for pain and neurological issues, the E-STEM. Uh, I'd like to play this video for you. Let's see. Back pain, nausea, all common conditions that doctors say can land people in the emergency room. But one local hospital is offering patients a new option to eliminate pain. Mary Stoker Smith explains it's based on a practice that's thousands of years old. It's a place where. The typical day is that nothing's typical. Coming through. And inside. The wounds appear to be superficial. There's some days where we see more minor cases, um, and some days where we have people that need full resuscitation. No matter the day when someone walks in. If anybody presents to the emergency department with what they consider an emergent condition, we will evaluate and treat them. But at the Aurora West Dallas Emergency Department, traditional treatment is being turned upside down with traditional Chinese medicine. Acupuncture has been around for thousands of years. It's been less than two years this ER has offered the alternative. I was skeptical. I wasn't sure. I, I knew of the practice, but I didn't know how it would work. It's a natural, non-pharmacological way to reduce pain. That means no medicine at all. This one is a, one of the most common relaxing points that we use here. An option emergency room doctors want for their patients. We have a real problem with narcotic opiate abuse and addiction in this country. We are currently in the throes of a opioid crisis. And it's just great to have an alternative to prescribing narcotics for, for some of these conditions. Conditions that are all too familiar in the ER. Pain is a very common presentation to the emergency department. I was just nauseous and pain head to toe and pretty much in fetal position. Barbara Orban opted for needles over narcotics during her hospital visit. And I was like, absolutely, <laughs> whatever it takes, get rid of this pain. Even she admits. I was like, what? You can't possibly tell me that sticking needles in my body is gonna take away this pain that I have. Hours later. They hadn't given me anything other than fluids and the acupuncture. And I walked out two hours later, just, it was unbelievable. Fascinating. Unbelievable. Doctors know acupuncture won't fix everything. And there are some cases where it's appropriate that we do use uh, opiates or narcotics to treat pain. But are glad to have an atypical option. The benefits are many. In a place where nothing is typical. Mary Stoker Smith, Fox 6 News. Aurora says so far more than half the patients offered the alternative have tried it. I was in an accident a few years ago and was treated with acupuncture. I'm a firm believer in it. It, it, it does amazing results, has amazing results. So, yeah. Interesting. Good for them. Definitely another option. Yeah. Well, we want to check in. Um, that's just one example of acupuncture being used in an inpatient setting. More and more teaching hospitals around the country are incorporating integrative medicine and um, acupuncture into their inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, so the WHO, um, the World Health Organization, does recognize a list of diseases, symptoms, and conditions that have been shown in controlled trials um, to be treated effectively by acupuncture. I've listed them all here, but for the purposes of today, I will just go through some of the ones that are more related to the fire, heart, and summer um, times. So you see here um, hypertension is listed under cardiovascular disorders. Um, there's also musculoskeletal, respiratory system disorders, disorders of the eye, ear, nose, and mouth. Um, and late summer is associated with the spleen and stomach, so gastrointestinal disorders um, are listed here, um, gynecological disorders, and also psychological disorders, which is one of my specialties, um, anxiety, depression, um, insomnia, and then other disorders like withdrawal from street and pharmacological um, drugs, as well as appetite suppression. So this is a study out of um, the Samuel A. Center for Integrative Medicine at UC Irvine, where a colleague of mine works, and they used electroacupuncture to treat high blood pressure. Um, and then I also 
um, published an article in JASA as part of my dissertation looking at the emotional component of disease, specifically um, hypertension and how stress affects that in our, um, in our bodies. And so by treating the, the stress and the li this liver chi stagnation as a TCM diagnosis, one of those uh, several that fall under hypertension, um, so how our emotions are related to disease and, and then how to treat that effectively with uh, acupuncture and herbal medicine. So you, we've talked some about theory, um, so now you're probably wondering, well, what about these needles, right? <laughs> Um, so initially, the first needles were made out of stone and animal bones. You can imagine that didn't feel very good. Um, the classical texts um, had an, t spoke about nine needles. I'm going to get the pictures up here. So you can see the, the bones there in the top right um, that were initially used to stimulate points on the body. And then from the classic text, they describe these nine different needles. Today, we use um, disposable, sterile, single-use needles that are generally individually packed or packed in sets of 10, um, so there's no risk of infection. Um, and you can see the size here compared to the paper clips. They're quite small, um, smaller than even the human hair. Um, so I don't know if any, I don't, you can guess. So this um, beveled needle here that connected to the syringe is something that we would use in the hospital setting. So you can see how many acupuncture needles are fitting inside of that beveled needle. So they're quite small. Um, so how does acupuncture work? This is just a really um, basic overview. So we stimulate the peripheral nervous system with the needles, which then stimulates the central nervous system, releasing chemicals and hormones in the body, which affect our pain response and also other biological processes. Um, again, qi, which is this energy that we talk about in Chinese medicine, when its flow in the body is unsmooth, and that leads to pain. So acupuncture helps things flow smoothly in the body. Um, including this qi, which, which helps to eliminate pain. Um, if you are deathly afraid of needles, we do also have ear seeds, um, which are made of different things, gold, silver, stainless steel, or even an actual vicaria seed, and they can be taped onto different places on the ear. Um, the ear itself is a hologram of the body, so the head is down here on the lobe of the ear, the spine wraps up the outside, and then the internal organs are on the inside of the ear. So we can treat uh, different conditions by putting those seeds in different places on the ear. They're generally left in uh, place for three to five days or until they fall off. And then um, if you have those ear seeds on, you can massage the point um, several times throughout the day whenever it comes to mind to continue to stimulate those areas. Um, we're not going to talk too much about herbal medicine today, but it is my specialty from China. There's over 400 single herbs, and those are combined in different ways to make up over 200 formulas. Um, herbs come in different uh, ways. They're bulk herbs are the raw herbs that you would boil in your home. Lots of people think it smells bad and tastes bad. So here in the US, um, many people will take tea pills, or patent medicine is another word for it, which are little BB-sized pills um, that are the decoction of those herbs boiled down and then made into pills. Um, another way to take it is by granule. So um, that would just be something that you could uh, re reconstitute in hot water, um, but it would still have the same flavor as the bulk herbs. Sometimes they can be sweetened uh, with honey. So some other modalities we're going to go over briefly include moxibustion, cupping, gua sha, tuina, and tai chi and qigong. Um, the first moxa is an herb called aye, it's mugwort leaf, um, and these are made into uh, this cones, or there's different ways to use them, um, and we burn those on or near the body. So we put a burn cream on the body so that the, the skin itself doesn't burn, it just allows the heat to go into that point. Um, so for lots of uh, painful conditions or cold conditions, we would use moxa. 
um, cupping is using warmed glass jars um, to suction on certain parts of the body. So they're a glass jar and we light a little cotton with some fire, put it in really quickly, that sucks the oxygen out so that it sticks onto the body. There's another modality called running cupping, which is where we would put some oil on the body, attach those cups and move them along channels that's typically done on the back, along the spine, where we hold a lot of tension in our muscles along the spine. Gua sha is another modality. It's typically, um, we use a, a special stone called bian shi, um, and, but any smooth object can be used, even like a ceramic spoon that you would have at the, the Chinese restaurant to eat your soup, that also works just as well. Um, you can see it's, um, we scrape pretty firmly, so it does make marks. You can see immediately after the treatment, 24 hours and then 48 hours later. And what that does is bring qi and blood to that area to help um, with different conditions. But lots of times pain, or if you're having a cold, an acute cold, gua sha can be used on the back of the neck to help relieve the fever. Um, tui na uh, literally means push and grab. Um, it's Chinese medical massage. Now this is not your typical Swedish massage. Again, like the gua sha, it can be a little firm. We use different techniques um, these are some photos of some training that I did in China uh, for adult tuina, but um, again, one of my specialties is pediatric tuina, which just uses the left hand of the child and their back to treat different conditions. Um, and Tai Chi and Qigong, um, which are movement and concentration exercises, are also really important. So I know that you guys have Tai Chi classes here at Friendship Heights. Um, and so I would encourage you to take full advantage of, of those to cultivate your own awareness of your inner qi and the movement of that qi. So um, let's talk more about summer. Um, summer season qi. The element is fire, which we mentioned already. Um, the environmental or the weather pattern associated with fire or, or summer is heat, of course, right? Um, and the heart that's associated, again, is, uh, is the organ that's associated with the summer season. Um, some, so red foods are going to be very tonifying for the heart. Um, for example, red wine, tomato, pomegranate. We know there's a lot of Western research about these foods. Um, however, one thing to understand is because those foods are also warm, um, then it's maybe not the best time to have them in the summer. Um, you want to, in the summertime, avoid salty flavors. So the salty taste is associated with the water element. Um, and we know from Western medicine research that if you have high blood pressure or heart disease, you want to avoid salt. So from a TCM perspective, um, if we have too much salt, which is associated with water, that water sort of douses the fire. So it, it overacts on the fire element and is going to damage the heart. Um, the emotion of the fire element is overjoy or impatience, so very excited, um, but to an extreme almost, um, and then that could lead to impatience. The late summer season chi, which is, um, some people might def define it as like the dog days of summer, you may have heard that um, phrasing, is toward the end of the summer. Um, when it's more humid and hot. Now, this was developed in Southeast Asia, where in the tropics there is a period of time at the end of summer where there's lots of rain, right? Um, so it's not necessarily applicable to everywhere in the world. For example, in California, they have really dry summers late in the year. So we need to be mindful that we really want to align with the seasons where we are um, in the world. So um, late summer is associated with the earth element, the environment or weather pattern is dampness. The organs that are associated with that are the spleen and stomach, um, which is uh, in TCM most of our digestion. Um, the color that's associated with the earth element is yellow. And some foods um, that tonify the spleen and stomach or boost the spleen and stomach are um, yellow and orange foods like carrots, pumpkins, yams, oranges. So in the late summer, you want to avoid tastes like sour and sweet. Um, so the sour taste astringes, and when there's a lot of dampness in the environment, we really need to like 
uh, let, it, let it out or disperse the dampness is one of the treatment modalities that we use in Chinese medicine. So if we eat astringing flavors or sour flavors, then that's going to hold all that in. Um, and the sweetness can be um, really cloying in the stomach, so you want to avoid sweet flavors in the summer. Um, the emotions that are associated with the earth element are, um, oh, I didn't change that, sorry, um, worry and anxiety. Um, here's another quote. So ancient Chinese believe that humans are microcosms of the larger surrounding universe and are interconnected with nature and subject to its forces. Balance between health and disease is a key concept. TCM treatment seeks to restore this balance through a treatment specific to the individual. So some seasonal eating for summer. Um, it's really going to depend on your constitution and the pattern of disarm disharmony that's in your body at that moment. Um, so the acupuncturist or the herbalist will definitely be looking, is there an excess or deficiency here? You know, what's the age of the patient? Is it hot? Are they hot or cold? Is there internal, external? factors at play, but we're going to go over some just really general um, recommendations. So the summer is an ideal time for a treatment method called Qingbu, which means clear and tonify. So that's going to clear the extra heat that the summer is bringing. So we want to use cooling foods when the environment outside is hot. Um, again, this is really general. If you have a cold condition, then we don't necessarily want to use cold foods, but this is in general. So some great summer choices are watercress, which we don't eat a lot of here in the US, but it can be on salads and blended in things, um, cucumber and watermelon. Um, some teas that are cooling are mint, um, which is really accessible. Chrysanthemum, which is a yellow flower. Um, you can find it sometimes already bagged or maybe the whole leaf, the flower that you could steep in tea and green tea among, compared with black teas, are more cooling. So having some of these in the summertime uh, will be beneficial. And then in the late summer, um, again, as I mentioned, this is an overlapping period at the end of summer into the beginning of autumn. Um, and during this period, we want to use the Danbu method, which is more bland foods. Um, and that's going to help to promote urination and drain the dampness from our body. So when the, it's really humid outside, um, and it's uh, damp and hot, then we want to drain that dampness. The watermelon, the white part of the watermelon, actually is uh, an herb in Chinese medicine that helps to promote urination. Um, another um, thing that we have more readily access to is barley. Um, this also helps to promote urination and drain dampness from the body. Um, things like winter melon, um, chen pi, which is like tangerine peel, lotus seeds, um, these things you can find in Asia. This is an example of a lotus seed. Each of these is a little lotus seed. Um, and then another herb called qian shi. These are all dietary, um, like, there are things that the Chinese use in their regular daily diet. So we don't have, it's hard to find them in our regular grocery stores, but if, you're, if you find yourself in an Asian market, you would be able to readily access these things. But barley is one. So if you want to incorporate that, if you eat rice and you want to put a little barley in or make a barley soup, um, the Koreans often use barley tea. So ro toasted barley and then steeped to make a tea would be a great thing to drink in late summer when it's humid outside. Um, so some self-care tips for summer. We want to eat less fried, dried, and spicy foods. So fried foods are very damp inducing. Um, dried foods um, and spicy foods, of course spice because it's already hot, right? Um, we want to avoid those. Uh, if you have any external infections or eczema with discharge or something like poison oak, um, you could use green tea as an external soak. So you would steep the tea and then cool it and then you could soak a washcloth and just put it on the area. Of course, this doesn't substitute seeing your physician, um, but maybe in the meantime, until your appointment, um, you could use a green tea external soak. Um, for high blood pressure and cholesterol, there's a classic tea combination that they use in China called Longjing, Zhu Hua Cha, which is, Longjing is just dragon well. We've heard of dragon well. It's a type of green tea. Zhu Hua is chrysanthemum. 
Um, and so they combine these together with hawthorn fruit. The Chinese name is shanja, and that helps with cholesterol. Um, and then the tangerine peel, again, is the chen pi um, that was mentioned previously. And so they put all those things together and steep it and drink that tea um, to help with high blood pressure and cholesterol. These are all pretty mild things. So um, even if you, you know, haven't met with an acupuncturist to get a, a specific TCM diagnosis or something, it, it shouldn't hurt anything, right? Um, so now I want to share with you some healing sounds. So each of the organs and elements come along with a sound that helps to treat our emotions. And I don't know if the audience today is willing to like try this out with me, um, but let's see who wants to participate. So for the summer, um, the sound is ha. So that's going to help relieve anxiety. Maybe if I count to three, we can all say ha together. What do you think? OK? One, two, three. Ha. Right? Or if you want to even put your hand over your heart and really feel like when we say ha, how that is going to cause some vibration there and that over that particular organ. So we'll try again. One, two, three. Ha. Can you feel that? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing, right? So then for late summer, which is more associated with the spleen, which is here, um, just under our stomach, um, the sound is who, 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 who feels it? Can you feel the vibration there when you say who? So um, you can take these as tools, right? So if you're feeling impatient in the summer, or you feel overheated, you want to just give your heart a blessing, then you can uh, make some of these sounds, okay, and bring your awareness to that area of the body. Um, herbal foot baths are also something that's used more often in China, but certainly can be incorporated here in the U.S. Um, some cooling herbs that you could put in a foot bath are mint or cucumber, green tea, and again, the barley to help drain dampness. Um, I have gotten done very quickly. <laughs> so, um, questions? Yes. I know you from blood pressure. Uh -huh. and I go to capital digestive care for irritable bowel syndrome. Mm -hmm. And th they urge me, for one of the things, to eat sauerkraut. Mm. And two of my friends who were very bright in these studies, oh, yes, that's wonderful. Well, it was a disaster. Okay. And we, in our household, we've had sauerkraut at Thanksgiving or Christmas because one of the relatives is German. I will never do that. We have to listen to our bodies. So that's, again... Oh, yeah. I think they're probably recommending that for the probiotic effects of the fermented foods. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, where, like, Western medicine often will make broad generalizations for different conditions, and maybe different individuals need different treatment. And that's... One thing that's really special about Chinese medicine is that it's really, you could think of it like a boutique medicine, right? They're really going to, we are going to really hone in on what's your body constitution, what season are we in, what part of the world are we in right now, um, where are you at in your life, um, and make a treatment that's really specific to you um, in that moment. And lots of the herbal formulas that we prescribe, they have to be adjusted over time because the body changes. Uh, it's not static. Thank you for your question. I suggested to. Yes, I have two questions. The one is, does do any of the Chinese uh, medicines or herbs interfere with regular medications that one is prescribed? That's mm -hmm. one, one question. Uh -huh. The other question is, um, when you do um, start an acupuncture treatment, um, what do you suggest? Uh, I know each individual is different, but would it be once a week, once a month, um, on a regular basis in order to see the progress? Great question. Yeah. Um, one of the things here, um, we do take a pharmacology class. Of course, I was already a nurse, so familiar with um, pharmacological things. But we do go over particular herbs can interact with particular medications. And acupuncturists are aware of those things. 
um, in China, um, they give them together. Um, so my advisor would simply say, don't take them at the same time. So for example, if you're going to take your blood pressure pill, take it before breakfast, wait a couple hours, and then take your herbal prescription. So you don't want them in the same mouthful, um, because that would potentiate the potential interaction. And there are definite um, no's, like don't put this with this, right? But other than that, I think if they're separated by time, and your pharmacological drugs have gotten through your stomach, and then you take the herbs, um, it should be OK. Um, and again, in China, they use them together all the time, really with no issue. Um, but I think here, we're more cautious in the US, right? Um, and if you're seeing an acupuncturist and your physician has questions or concerns, absolutely put them together. Let them have a conversation. Um, lots of times, it's just a lack of knowledge on the physician's part about um, you know, those interactions, those potential interactions, and, and your course of treatment with the patient. And the second question was, um, yes, so that's another difference between here in, the U uh, in China. Um, here in the US, most um, patients will come in about once a week um, for four, six, eight, 12 weeks, depending on the condition. Um, acute conditions, like the common cold, can be treated quickly. Um, more chronic conditions take longer to treat. Um, in China, um, for example, I worked in an acupuncture clinic that treated patients with Bell's palsy, and they came in every day. Um, so that's a sudden onset, usually. It's, it's, it comes on really suddenly. You know, you got the facial droop on one side, and they're getting treatment daily for a week or two weeks, and then they'll take a week off and come back uh, as it improves. So it depends. With our lifestyle here, I think it's really hard for people to come in daily, right? But if it's a really severe condition and that's what would be best, that may be recommended. But generally, once or twice a week at the most in, here in the US. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. In today's world, where we're more aware of animal extinction, mm -hmm. um, many animals, as you know, have been used traditionally in Chinese medicine, yes. the rhinos for one. Mm -hmm. Has the awareness of extinction made a difference as far as Chinese? Absolutely. That is one of the things that we talk about in our herbal medicine classes. Um, here in the US, the entry level for acupuncturists is a master's degree, and that's about 3,000 hours of training. So it takes three or four years to complete. And a, a big part of that is herbal medicine study. Um, and we do talk about the animal products that are used. Um, they are stronger and more potent, but we're able to make formulas if a patient doesn't want to use animal products without those herbs in them. Um, and I know there are certain herbs that are banned here in the US because of the, the extinction. And I think even in China, it's, it's becoming more and more um, respected, you know, these, these animals that were bred for the herbal use. <laughs> Okay, that's a great question. So here in the U.S., again, master's level is entry level. So they would have come with a bachelor's degree, maybe in a science or maybe not. I went to school with PTs, but also went to school with graphic designers. So lots of people change careers. Um, in California, they're the most stringent. That's where I got my master's degree, and it is 3,000 hours of training. Um, that was three and a half years for me because I finished a little quickly, but it's a four-year program. Um, and then you sit for a licensing exam in the state where you want to practice. So I sat for the California board exam, just like a physician would sit for their board exam. Um, there's also a national, it's called NCCAOM, the national, I'm not going to get it what it is, but it's a national certifying body, um, which allows other states um, to us to transfer our license more easily. So for example, when I came here, I wanted to get licensed in DC and Maryland. Um, because I had also taken the NCCOM exam at the same time I took my Cali exam, um, then it, I just, it was just an application process. So there's a national certification, and there's also state level licensing exams. Um, more and more acupuncturists are also getting their doctorate degrees, um, which is called DAOM in most places, Doctor of Oriental an acupuncture, yeah, DAOM, Doctor of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. 
Um, my was a PhD from China. I had an opportunity to study there on full scholarship, so I couldn't say no. Um, so my credentials include that. It's not recognized here without more paperwork, so that's why I put China after. If you check with a conventional doctor, they have to either approve or disapprove. You and your acupuncture. Um, you mean for it to be covered on your insurance? Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, you're certainly welcome to talk with your physician and get their opinion um, if they would recommend it. More and more physicians um, are more aware of other treatments that are available, and so they're recommending their patients to, to seek acupuncture in, in, instead of, for example, taking opioids for pain. Um, but yeah, I absolutely encourage you to talk to your physician. And if they have questions or they're not as familiar, then have them reach out to your potential acupuncturist and have a conversation. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do like lunch and learns in physicians' offices too, because sometimes it's just a lack of exposure or, or knowledge about what we offer. There was a question in the back. Um, could you talk a bit about the uh, uh, adolescent mental health problems and what can be done through acupuncture? Mm -hmm. Sure. I didn't hear the first word that you said before mental health. Yes, adolescent. Adolescent. Okay. So acupuncture can be used for all ages. Um, in China, they even use it on children. There was a photo in the presentation. I was stimulating some needles on a child's face. Um, uh, typically here in the US, we use other modalities besides acupuncture. But adolescents, I think, are old enough to accept that sort of treatment here. Um, and, and acupuncture and herbal medicine both can be very effective for different mental health conditions, particularly anxiety, depression, insomnia, and others. Um, I'd be happy to speak with you after if you have a, something specific in mind. Across practitioners of Chinese medicine, how consistent is mm -hmm. the practice of what you describe? Is one likely to get the same kinds of assessment, diagnosis, and treatment? That's a great question. Here in Maryland, there's a, um, the, the primary acupuncture school here in Maryland uses a five element theory. That's not something I was trained in. Um, and so they use a different method of, of diagnoses and treatment. But it's, my understanding is it's all based on these classic texts, right? And the basic theory is the same. And then through time, people have interpreted it differently. Um, not every acupuncturist is great for every person. And so it's, it's kind of like also your physician or your chiropractor. You may have to try a few. Um, if the first time is uh, a miss, um, then don't say, I, I would encourage you to, to not like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Try, try a different acupuncturist. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of that resonance and, and their treatment modalities, their expertise. Lots of acupuncturists here in the U.S. also really specialize. There's fertility specialists and you know neurological specialists, and so they most of their experience has been in that field. But where the basic training across the U.S. is pretty standard, but again, it depends on what school they went to, um, what their specific training was. And where is Maryland School? It's called MUIH, Maryland University of Integrative Health, and I believe they're in Laurel. Um, there's also a school in Virginia um, called, I can't think of it right now, but there's a school in Virginia as well. My, I went to school in California at a place called Five Branches University. Mm -hmm. Hi, yes. thank you. Um, I have done, I have had the uh, architecture uh, on several occasions without results, and when I talked to the architectures about it, it said that I think so. Um, you know, there's, there's quotes in the ancient texts that say, you know, even some of the best doctors only go to be able to treat 50% of patients or 60% of patients. I mean, we can't always help everyone with every condition. Um, but uh, again, I think it's worth exploring other acupuncturists or seeing what other modalities may be available. Um, and it also really um, is important to incorporate whatever diet and lifestyle changes that 
might also be beneficial. I think, you know, in Western medicine, we, we often want to just take a pill and, and have it be better. Um, and TCM doesn't work that, it's, that way. It's really a whole health, whole life, whole body, um, body, mind, and spirit uh, medicine. Um, and so incorporating other pieces to adjunct to the, the treatment that you're getting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I think you thought this was extremely interesting. I would, I'm would sure a lot of people uh, would like to know what type of insurance coverage, different types of acupuncturists mm -hmm. have. Sure, and that's up to the individual acupuncturist. Um, for example, I, I work as a nurse at Suburban, and our employee health plan covers 20 appointments per year. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to go get acupuncture from someone and they took my insurance, then I would have 20 appointments covered. Some acupuncturists don't accept insurance because the reimbursement rate is so is low. Um, and, but lots of the major insurance companies do um, cover acupuncture. So you just need to call your benefits and they'll let you know what's covered. Yeah, Medicare, Medicare does cover um, treatment for low back pain. And there, we're doing a lot of lobbying right now because it covers physician acupuncturists, not licensed acupuncturists. So that's a medical doctor that has taken 300 hours of training to do acupuncture. Um, they're able to do it, um, but we're not covered. So that's something that we're working on. You know, as, as things become more and more in demand in the U.S., then the laws need to change, right? So that patients can have access. Um, so Medicare does cover um, acupuncture for low back pain if you see a medical acupuncturist. Yes? I'm young man. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, our, our health is really like an onion. Our health is really like an onion. So when some, one thing is fixed, another thing comes up. You know, so if you, it's just like seeing your regular doctor, right? Um, and once they treat whatever the acute issue is right now, then, you know, something else may arise and, and then you're there already in relationship with that practitioner to, to treat those things. <laughs> Some of the research that's been done around acupuncture, um, they try to use what they call sham acupuncture um, t to make these models of research like with randomized controlled trials, but it's really challenging because it's difficult for the patient. I mean, if you're not getting a needle, you know, right, versus getting a needle. So, um, but one of the things that has been shown in the research is that there is this component of the patient practitioner relationship that has a healing effect. And so it is very important to really resonate and find the acupuncturist that's right for you. Um, yeah, I'm glad you found one. Yes. Would you slide up with the citations again? Oh, sure. Thanks. This first one is where I got the quotes um, that I shared with you from Johns Hopkins. The second is the research article on electroacupuncture. Um, I don't remember what the third one is. 
The, the fourth is just a photo that I took. Um, and then some of the dietetic information, um, Dr. Jeffrey Pong was one of, was our herbal physician in a school that, that came from his book. Um, you're welcome. Uh, not every, but it is part of our training. Um, so they they should have some knowledge. If you have questions and you want to, if you see someone and then you can ask them, well, what should I be eating? What should I not be eating? And they they'll have some insight for you, or they'll know where to find it. Yeah. The ear seeds, uh huh. Not as effective, but we can often put those on after a treatment to help extend the effectiveness of a treatment. Um, and then it really empowers the patient then to be able to have some control, you know, as they leave the office the next several days before their next appointment, they can stimulate those points on their ears, which will extend the effectiveness of the treatment. Mm -hmm. For kids, we often use ear seeds if they're afraid of needles. I, I volunteer at a community clinic that's, that uh, treats um, uninsured individuals, and we use auricular acupuncture. Um, but then we send them home with ear seeds so that um, during the week that we don't see them, they can, they can take some charge of their health, right? Yes. I'm just curious about dry needle. Um, mm -hmm. my, my son in law goes to a sports therapy where they do dry needle that he finds very helpful. What, what do you think about that? That's a good question and very controversial. It depends on who you ask. So dry needling is um, essentially acupuncture, um, but uh, physical therapists are using it um, without doing the acupuncture training. Um, so they're typically using those needles on trigger points, and the way that they're stimulating is quite forceful. Some people find it very painful, um, but they, it's not, it's not acupuncture in the sense that an acupuncturist is going to do it. It's the, it's the technical procedure of acupuncture, um, perhaps more similar to what like a medical acupuncturist would be doing, sort of this procedural thing without the diagnosis and, um, and all that's involved in, in that, that, that an acupuncturist is going to go through with you. So we're also lobbying to, to have that taken away or at least, you know, limited, it's sort of, you know, Professions arguing over scope, it's really unfortunate. Um, but we, at the end of the day, we want to make sure patients are safe. And um, there's more and more people showing up in the ER with a collapsed lung because a poorly trained person put a needle in and it went too deep or whatever because of you know, lack of training. Anywhere on the chest or back that's not, you know, our scapula protect our lung there, but you know, we're trained at the size and the length and the angle and all of that, and um, not everyone is. In Maryland recently, there were athletic trainers that were fighting for rights to do dry needling, and thank goodness they didn't, it didn't pass um, because their training is even less, of course, than a physical therapist. It's best if it's ongoing. It's not a one and done, for sure. Um, again, for acute conditions like the common cold, you may get effects really quickly. Uh, for more chronic conditions, it's going to take longer. Um, this is my contact information. Um, if you have any other questions, snap a picture. or um, I have cards here. If you want to speak to me afterwards, feel free to take a card. Yeah. Thank you so much.